Dear El Beamish, an 18-year-old deaf and mute boy, was convicted of violently killing a woman in December 1961. He had confessed in writing to this homicide and was sentenced to death immediately after. Sounds a little fishy, right? Well, today's story is not only about the horrifying actions of a serial killer, but also those of the authorities. The same authorities that are created to defend its citizens would go on to intentionally destroy lives of many innocent people. Today, we cover a story of an Australian serial killer named Eric Edgar Cook. This man terrorized the streets of Perth in the 50s and 60s. He has many nicknames including the Nightcaller and the Nedlands Monster. He was also referred to as Cookie by those who knew him. Cook was born on 25th February 1931 in Victoria Park, a suburb of Perth. His father, Vivian Cook, and mother, Christine Cook, decided to get married when Christine was pregnant with Cook. While Christine was overjoyed for the birth of her first child, Vivian was known to strongly dislike his son. Vivian was an alcoholic who was violent towards his wife, Cook, and two other daughters. Christine would often sleep in a staff room where she worked to avoid Vivian's violence. Cook, being the older child, had an instinct to protect his mother and his sisters, which would often result in a beating from his own father. He was not only abused at home, but also bullied at school, two places where a child should feel protected and safe. He was so tormented by his father's violence that he would roam the streets at night and hide when he would come back home. Cook had a cleft lip and palate, which left him feeling insecure and made him an easy target for bullying. He had few surgical procedures to repair his cleft palate. However, he was left with a noticeable scar right above his lip. The constant bullying and violence caused him to be introverted, awkward, and he would often speak in a mumble. He was ostracized by other children as they would never let him be a part of the regular school activities. Other children would taunt him, mimic him, and call him all sorts of names. Needless to say, all of this left him feeling neglected, insecure, and rejected from the society as well as his own family. As a result of this, he would often act up and get in trouble. Before dropping out, he was placed in five different schools. He dropped out of school at the age of 14, minimum age at the time to leave school. He started working as a delivery boy and would give most of his pay to his mother to help out. His father was known to provide no support for the family, leaving Christine to support the entire family on her own. After such a rough childhood, Cook started getting involved in petty crimes and stealing. For example, when he worked at a junior surf life-saving club, he stole a watch and engraved it with a personalized message to make it look like an award. The watch read, to Cookie from the boys at the surf club. Eventually, when the management found out, Cook was terminated. Mumbled speech and noticeable scars were not the only physical issues that he had. He would often have blackouts at work, which would sometimes lead to him getting terminated. When he was 16, he had his skull fractured when he was trying to stop his father from beating his mother. At this point, he felt like the victim. He wanted to steal from rich and happy people. He desperately wanted to fit in somewhere. At the age of 17, he would go on a spree of these break-ins. He would roam the streets at night and look through houses. He started breaking into people's homes, slashing and burning their clothes and bedding. For example, he once entered a home, gathered all the clothes on the bed, and then poured wine all over it. He was basically going around at night and peeping into people's homes, checking if someone was home. And if he was in the clear, he'd break in, take some valuables, and leave a lot of damage. He was eventually caught by a neighbor and cops were called. They took his fingerprints, which were a match to many other break-ins. He finally admitted that it was actually him all along. He was the one behind all these random break-ins. He explained that he was short on money and had been on workers' compensation. Two months after, he was convicted on two charges of stealing, four charges of arson, and seven charges of breaking and entering. 
Even though he was sentenced for three years, he was released within three months on probation. The authorities took into consideration that he had a pretty bad childhood and wanted to give him a second chance. Needless to say, this would go on to be a very bad decision. At the age of 21, he enrolled in military. He was considered to be a great rifleman. Cook loved the military life because his speech impairments did not discourage his passion. The military was a place for him to vent his aggression and where he got a lot of respect. However, 14 weeks in, someone discovered his past and he was dismissed. He went back to Perth at the age of 22 where he was caught stealing again. He was placed on a good behavior bond and sent away. He got a job as a truck driver where he met Sally Levin. She was a lovely woman from Liverpool and was charmed by Cook as he often presented himself as a gentleman. They would date only for four months and then get married in 1953. In 1954, his first child named Michael was born. The couple would go on to have four boys and three girls. This was kind of Sally's dream. She always wanted a large family and a loving husband. But soon after, she realized that this may have not been the man of her dreams that she always imagined. Cook soon followed after his father's footsteps, being violent to his wife and his children. Sally knew that Cook would roam the streets at night since his teenager years. She also knew that he was a thief. However, she didn't know the extreme violence that he would soon take on. For the entire time, she would think that he's probably involved in only small petty crimes and also suspected that he might even have an affair with another lady, which is why he wouldn't return home for many nights. She was a religious woman and therefore during those days, leaving him was never really an option for her. During these times, Perth was considered a country town with a fairly small population. People were also very trusting of each other. They never really had any serious crimes, so they would leave their house doors open, cars unlocked, and keys in the ignition, making things very easy for a person like Cook. These days, this kind of thing would be considered calling for trouble. However, back then, this was very normal for Perth and the people of Perth. So Cook's paralling at night continued, but it would now escalate to stealing cars and following women. One evening, he stole a car to follow a girl and ended up crashing the car. He was jailed for two years and additional six months for breaking the good behavior bond that he had been on. In 1958, Cook was back to his typical habits of breaking and entering and stealing cars. But there was one big change. He started wearing women's white gloves. He had been caught once because of his fingerprints and he was not going to let it happen again. In September 1958, he was going around a neighborhood, his usual thing just roaming the streets. He was very familiar with the neighborhood and he spotted a car. The car belonged to a woman that he had previously followed. The keys were in the ignition, so he slowly rolled it down the driveway and drives off with the car. A few blocks down, he saw a woman riding a bike. He let her ride for a bit to give her a heads up and then he struck the woman with his car. This woman went flying and ended up hitting her head on the road. He drove away with the bike still attached to the car. The woman's name was Nell Schneider. She was a 26-year-old mother of two and was returning from a choir practice. The police ran the plate and determined that it was a stolen car, but no fingerprints were found. While she survived, she would suffer from post-traumatic epilepsy, including seizures and blackouts. Sounds terrible, right? Well, this would just be the beginning and Cook would strike again. Molly McLeod, a 15-year-old, was sleeping in her room when she heard somebody going through her stuff. So while he was trying to steal, Molly woke up. Taking no chances of being reported, he hit her head and she immediately fainted. She woke up with a bloody fractured skull and did not remember anything. She would survive, but no one knew who did this. In January of 1959, Cook had stolen a knife from a bike while he was roaming the streets. He ended up at Mill Point Road where he saw a flat and entered a sleeping woman's room. He was very happy to see that she was sleeping naked. However, she also woke up while he was trying to steal. Again, not willing to take any chances of being caught, he stabbed her with his stolen knife. 
She tried her best to fight him. She even caused him three deep scars on his face. Unfortunately, he stabbed her to death. This woman's name was Penina Berkman. She worked at a perfume counter at David Jones and was dating a radio personality. The murder ended up being a huge news in Perth as this type of crime was unheard of. Evidence included blood under her nails, but keep in mind that DNA was not a thing yet. Therefore, the blood for the detectives was useless. Neighbors reported screaming and also witnessed a person roaming the streets at night. However, there were no fingerprints found on the scene. On the other hand, Cook had a story cooked up for his wife. He said that he was playing with his disabled son, Michael, and he scratched him, so his family did not suspect anything at all. He continued with the break-ins, and at this point, Cook was feeling as if he could get away with anything, including murder. On 19th December 1959, Cook committed his second murder. This one would be much more savage in nature. Jillian Brewer was a well-known interior designer who lived next to her mother, Betty Johnston. Unfortunately for Jillian, Cook had been roaming streets all night and had stolen a hatchet from another house. He directly headed to Jillian's room where she was sleeping naked. He struck her with the hatchet, injuring her face, throat, genitals, and breast. Then he took a break and had some lemonade and then came back with a pair of scissors and stabbed her breast and stomach with the scissors. Before calling it a night, he also stabbed her in the left butt. The nature of this crime was so heinous, much more savage than anything Cook had done before. Eventually, the police found the hatchet but no fingerprints were ever located. There were no witnesses either. However, the police did connect Penina and Jillian's homicide cases. At home, Cook convinced his wife to provide him with an alibi because he was sure that the police will try to pin it on anyone with a record. Well, he was kind of right because the detectives did question him, but he denied everything and he was left alone. And I'm guessing an alibi from his wife also helped. This is where Daryl Beamish comes in. The 18-year-old deaf and mute boy that I had mentioned in the beginning of this story. He was waiting for a sentencing for another matter and during this time he was questioned with respect to Jillian's murder. Beamish allegedly confessed in writing and during an interview. In June 1961, he was charged with the murders but he pled not guilty and stated that he was forced into these confessions. Regardless, the jury found him guilty and he was sentenced to death. Fortunately for him, his death sentence was converted into life in prison eventually. While Beamish was taking a fall for Cook's actions, Cook felt untouchable. He felt as if he could do anything he wanted and never get in trouble. He would then go on a spree of trying to hit and kill women with stolen cars. And as we can imagine, the city was in a complete shock. Constant hit and runs were taking place at night during almost the same time with stolen cars. While the police were able to conclude that it was one person, they did not have much evidence to identify who it may have been. Two years later, on March 3, 1962, he broke into a 23-year-old Anne Melvin's apartment and woke up to cook strangling her with a towel. She passed out and he used her own stockings to tie her hands and arms to the bed. He began taking her pants off but went out to investigate a sound that he had heard. Meanwhile, Anne started screaming as loud as she could, scaring Cook away. But this didn't stop Cook. On December 29th, Peggy Belleville also woke up to Cook trying to remove her clothes. He struck her, however, she kept screaming and he ran away. These attacks continued in Perth for a long time. He killed two women, almost killed many others, and conducted multiple hit and runs. Even after all this, he was not done yet. So far, his attacks were fairly random, but they appear to have targeted mostly women. But this would change on January 26, 1963. On Australia Day, Cook would go on a murder spree that shook Australia. This incident would be known as the Australia Day shootings. On the night of January 26th, Cook traveled to the suburb of Como and broke into a home. He stole a 22 caliber and ammunition along with it. 
He then stole a car and drove off to the seaside suburbs, where he started prowling on foot looking for people to kill. On early morning of 27th January, he saw a couple drinking beer in their car. The couple started kissing and Cook just stood there watching them. The couple immediately noticed Cook and started shouting at him. In response, Cook then shot the couple. The bullets barely missed the couple and they left the scene immediately. But Cook still had the urge to kill. He then roamed the streets until he came across a 31-year-old Brian Weir. He was a star athlete and was sleeping in his apartment by himself. Cook pointed the gun at Brian and shot him. While Brian would survive for the time being, he was left disabled, blind in one eye, and had speech impairment. He would pass away two years later. After shooting Brian, Cook then headed to Nedlands looking for more people to kill. He came across a boarding house where he saw a 19-year-old John Lindsay sleeping in the veranda. John was shot to death by Cook and he died instantly. Cook then randomly walked around and rang a doorbell of a house owned by a man named George. George was confused as to who would come and see him at 4 a.m. Cook hid around the house and when George opened the door, Cook shot him to death. He then threw the rifle in the nearby river and headed home to his wife and children. In less than 24 hours, Cook had shot five people. Perth was on a lockdown as there was a maniac on the loose. People were terrified. They started taking extreme precautions. The police had barely any evidence even though they knew all of the bullets came from the same gun. At this point, the police were under extreme pressure to solve this case and put a stop on the vicious activities taking place in the city. The pressure would only further increase when a 17-year-old girl walking home alone was killed by Cook on February 9, 1963. He crashed into her on high speed and left her bleeding to death. This girl's name was Rosemary. Rosemary and John Buddens were madly in love. John was waiting for her to turn 18 to get married. On that day, they had an argument and she left in anger to go home. He chased her in his car and requested her to come back. She told him to go away for a little bit while she calms down. However, given the circumstances of the city, John felt very uncomfortable with this idea. So he decided to smoke a cigarette and then he would follow her again to get her to come back home. During these few minutes, Cook struck Rosemary with his car. Cops were eventually involved and John was the first one to get interrogated. John's car was also inspected and it was noticed that there was damage on the car's left headlight. This made John a suspect even though he continuously denied it. He stated that the damage to his car was a result of an accident that happened three weeks ago and he had even reported the accident. Allegedly, John gave a written confession of Rosemary's murder and he was found guilty and sentenced to 10 years in jail. After putting John and Daryl in the jail, there was some satisfaction that some killers were in the jail. However, that satisfaction would only last few days. On February 15, 1963, Cook entered Lucy's house. He strangled her with a phone cord and killed her. He then had sex with her dead body. He dragged the body out of her house and then violated it with a whiskey bottle. He then put the bottle under her arm and left her body in her neighbor's backyard. After killing Lucy, he laid low for about four months and then he struck again with his break-ins. On August 1963, he found another 22 rifle during a break-in. He then roamed the streets at night until he saw an open garage door. He came across an 18-year-old Shirley McLeod. He shot her one time in the head, instantly killing her. Shirley was at home babysitting for a couple's son, Carl and Wendy Dowd. The baby fortunately was unhurt. And at this time, Perth went into a complete panic. The police were in luck when they found a fingerprint. However, back then everything was done manually and therefore the investigators had to fingerprint literally every single person, one by one. 20 minutes away from the crime scene, Leila Kina and her husband were walking when they came across a 22 caliber rifle. They instantly told the cops and eventually the gun was tested and matched to Shirley's death bullet. Cops were quick to set up a trap where the gun was found. 
Investigators included the media to telecast that the next search would take place in that area in hopes that the killer would come back for the gun. They even placed the fake gun there so that the killer would actually approach the gun to grab it. 17 days later, a man pulled up. He looked around and headed straight to the bush to get the rifle. The police immediately captured that man. The man was none other than Eric Edgar Cook. Cook refused all allegations. But Sally told the police that Cook was not home the night of Shirley's murder. He finally admitted to the murders. He actually confessed to everything in a lot of detail. The police were shocked at how good his memory was. He even told them where he threw the rifle for Australia Day shootings. He also confessed to Lucy's, Panina's and Jillian's murders. But they already had others locked up for Panina, Jillian and Rosemary's murders. Due to his excellent memory, he gave them details that only the killer would know. However, when it came to Rosemary's murder, he was off by a couple of meters where her body was found. The cops decided that he was lying to delay his convictions. And therefore, the police told him to retract his confessions. You can tell that the cops told him to retract his confessions only because they were worried that they had somebody else locked up. Back in jail, John had heard about the confessions and had a sigh of relief. However, his hopes quickly vanished when he realized Cook had retracted his confession. Cook was arrested for multiple murders. Soon after, he was sentenced to death. Right before he was hanged, he confessed again that he had in fact murdered Rosemary, Jillian, and Panina. Let me say that again. Moments before he died, this man confessed again to two other murders. I mean, it was unlikely that he had a motive to confess to something he didn't do moments before his death. But the authorities ignored it. At this point, we know that Eric Cook was a serial killer who eventually was hanged. End of the problem. But no one seemed to bat an eye about two men who were still in prison serving time for the murders that were committed by Cook. This would be the case for decades until John Budden's brother, Jim Budden's, met Stell Blackburn while they were out dancing. Stella happened to be an investigating journalist and when she heard Jim's story about his brother, she was left in shock. Being great at what she did, she could not just ignore the story. So she took it upon herself to find the truth. She met John in 1992 and heard his part of the story. She was very well connected and found records that were never made public. She found hundreds of confessions that were made by Cook, but these confessions were never made public to maintain government's image. She also investigated the detectives that were handling the investigations at the time. John stated that he was physically abused until a confession was forced out of him. Max Baker, the investigator who oversaw the investigation of John Buddens, in an interview he stated that he had jailed many people just after a hunch. In 2002, John was finally exonerated and his conviction was overturned. Three years later, Daryl's conviction was also overturned. Somehow, Daryl's case was even worse. At the time of Daryl's interrogation, the cops had brought no lawyer, no parents, while Daryl had an understanding of a 7-year-old while he was 18 years old. It was found that he was told to copy a confession that the police had written word to word. The detectives had literally forced him physically to do it, and by that I mean they were holding his hand to write the confession. The police knew that he was disabled and forced him into a death sentence intentionally. Max Baker and many others accepted promotions and awards for convicting Daryl and John, knowing very well that they were not the ones who committed the murders. In 2004, Daryl's sixth appeal was approved and in 2005, his conviction was overturned. Western Australian police has never apologized to any of these individuals and no one was ever held accountable. Stell took it upon herself to tell the stories of Cook's confessions to the victims or the victims' families because the confessions were never released. Cook's oldest son, Tony, worked as a social worker for his entire lifetime and brought big changes in Australia. Tony died in 2018 from cancer and Sally Levin died in 2019. Now, this is the end of the story, but before you sign off, I do have a little request. A lot of work goes into these videos and I would truly appreciate it if you could please go ahead and subscribe and like this video. Only if you want to, no pressure at all. 
If you do subscribe, please let me know in the comments down below and I would love to come and say hi to you. A shout out for this video goes to Jez, Elise, PM and I think few others who requested an Australian case. I hope I did some justice to this story and thank you for your support. As always, I appreciate you and thank you so much for tuning in today.